Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, week four in our series, uh, Trending Conversations with Culture. Today we face a really uh, very difficult question, and uh, it, it's one that you're sure to meet, uh, especially if you're inter- interacting with your neighbors right away, and, and uh, it, it's one that can really uh, put you on edge a little bit and perhaps make you defensive. I want to encourage you not to. Uh, that question, of course, is who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl today? <laughs> yeah, I see the Denver fan. I see all the orange out here. Okay, uh, so really, we have no answer to that question, so we're actually going to think about another question today, and it has to do with the uh, uh, potential conflict between faith and science. And as you know, if you're uh, new here today, uh, you don't know, but if you're new today, what we've been doing is, is looking at a number of topics that we anticipate will come up just as we uh, go about loving our neighbors and uh, loving where we live and and uh, we, we really take seriously what God said to us about love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, God says, and love your neighbor as yourself. So we're all about practicing the art of neighboring and, and building friendships. And as we do so, as we have opportunity to share our lives with each other, that uh, it's easy for us like you know, at times to talk about God and, and that he's a big part of our life. And, and so in the process of that, we know that there are certain questions that are trending that may come up. And so we're, we're really spending time thinking about, well, what is that and how do we respond to that? So uh, you remember our foundational verse, Colossians chapter 4, 5 and 6, by way of review. Let me show that to you again. He says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outsiders. Not just outside the church, but more importantly, they're outside of faith. Okay, they're far away from God. He says, learn to walk in wisdom toward them. He says, make the most of every opportunity that you have. And then he says, let your speech be seasoned or, uh, with, with grace and seasoned with salt. Okay, let your speech be gracious and seasoned with salt. In other words, look, so w- when you're interacting, that there's a, a lot of grace. And in fact, you, you respond in ways that uh, are salty in the sense that it's intriguing. Like they, they, they want to maybe know more. You know, salt has that effect that, you know, you eat one salted chip, you want another one. Uh, and so that you know how to answer everyone with a question. So it implies dialogue, not some stiff, you know, presentation, but conversation and dialogue. And so that's what we're talking about. We said that wisdom begins with understanding that our country has been moving over several decades. Uh, it seems like it's the, the pace is quickening, but there's this movement from theism in terms of a worldview to secularism. And, you know, we, we've kind of highlighted that each week, and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but you, you remember that with, with secularism, there's not really a belief in God, or if there is, it, it's, it's a nominal belief in God. It's not, he, he, he has no real relevance in practical uh, life. Uh, regarding creation, they would reject uh, creationism in favor of naturalism, the idea that you know, somehow what we see and what we experience came about through natural processes. Um, truth is not, um, you know, objective and authoritative. It's subjective. It's relative. And oftentimes, especially in, in postmodernism, it's very relational. And so not only will I not reject what you say and believe, because that would not be politically correct, and we're all about tolerance and yeah, and so, you know, it, 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 it's relational in the sense that I like you, and so I'm going to affirm whatever you uh, believe and think. And so that, that's just all kind of part of the, the whole move to secularism. You know, they, they believe that morality is really defined more by government than by God. Uh, it's devi- defined by government of a majority. And so anyway, we've had this move, and, and learning wisdom, how to relate to our world, is just understanding that dynamic. And so what we're trying to do is learn how to interact in a way uh, that helps people kind of uh, imagine, you know, what, what is biblical faith? So anyway, we've looked at a number of topics. We looked at religion, like, you know, isn't religion the source of all evil in the world? We kind of talked about that. Last week we talked about what about uh, same-sex marriage. That's a very important issue in our culture. We talked about that. So today we're talking about th- this issue of uh, science and faith. Are they, are they friends or are they foes? Can they be friends or will they always be foes? And, and for many people, they, they, they see this real conflict. And so in our series, we, we've kind of had a template we've been following 
talking a little bit about the tension of the topic, and then what tone do we need to bring and what truth can we uh, bring to it as well. So if you're into following your notes, you'll find that. Let's talk a little bit more about the tension between faith and science. And it's really kind of the tension that sometimes between you know the faith-only crowd and the science-only crowd, and sometimes those can be opposed to each other. One of those reasons is that uh, the science-only camp really believes that faith is unnecessary. Like science keeps answering all the big questions about life, and every answer, every question they answer makes God a little bit less uh, needed, n- less necessary. Uh, they, they believe that, um, you know, that uh, uh, those in the faith-only crowd are intellectually primitive. Uh, they believe that uh, the church has been uh, suppressive in terms of scientific discovery at different periods in the life of the church, and they really don't distinguish what they mean by church. And uh, we all know that there have been dark periods in our history, especially in medieval times, when the, the, the church really didn't represent biblical Christianity. And the church has at different times lost its way, but nevertheless, they, they, they would view the church as suppressing scientific discovery. And so when you turn on the TV and, and you, know, you look at a program like Cosmos, a space-time odyssey, a fascinating show, which is really an heir to uh, Carl Sagan's previous show, Cosmos, a, a, a personal journey, that one of the things that you'll hear, one kind of small theme through there, is basically how uh, the church or religion has suppressed scientific discovery. So, um, you know, that's part of why they're upset or why they look down on the faith-only camp. The faith-only camp kind of looks at the science-only camp and they say, well, you know, th- these guys are anti-God. Uh, many times they-, they would say they are arrogant. Like they-, they, feel- they feel like that they have all the answers and like they don't need help from anybody else. And, and-, and they view them with arrogance. Uh, sometimes uh, they view them as... Um, really narrow in the sense of what they're willing to consider and not consider. They would view them uh, evil. You know, they, they'll, they'll quote out of Romans 1 that because they suppress the truth, like, you know, they proclaim to be wise, but really they're fools. You know, they'll quote uh, Psalm 24, 1, I believe it is, that, you know, he, he who has rejected God or says there is no God is, is a fool in his heart. And so, I mean, they, they kind of look at them in, in that way, that dismissive kind of way. All of that which is to say is there is... Uh, can be real tension. In fact, uh, one person, uh, Peter Atkins, a uh, British chemist, uh, in writing The Limitless Power of Science, says this. He says, science and and religion cannot be reconciled. Religion has failed, and its failures should stand exposed. Science should be acknowledged as king. Well, there you kind of get the sense that, wow, science and faith really are foes. They really are in conflict. What we're going to argue today is that's not necessarily true, but when you're interacting with somebody who kind of comes from that point, and and they say something like, "Um, you know, I I appreciate your faith. I I have just struggled with the fact that faith seems to be anti-science, and I am am very pro-science. You know, I've studied in this field. I work in this field, and, and, you know, this is what I've seen, and Maybe they've heard and they're reacting to others in the faith camp who have uh, pushed dogmatism in a, in a big way. But whatever, they, they just say, you know, if, if faith is being anti-science, I'm not sure I want to be a part of faith. Because they've hitched their wagon to science. And so it's not, uh, it's not rare that we have conversations like that or overhear conversations. And so given the tension, what do we say? Well, as we move into the tone part of our message here, There's a number of things that we can say, but let me suggest one for us to interact with. And that is simply this, where I might say, you know, you you may find it surprising that faith and science actually have a lot in common. Faith and science really have much in common. Because those who see as two really diametrically opposed things, they don't think that they have much in common, but they really do. And I want to spend some time here on three things that they have in common. All right, number one, the first thing is that they both have a catalog of really prominent contributors, uh, prestigious contributions. Okay, so when you go back to kind of the earliest scientific contributions, the the beginning uh, of science, that all the major players 
were, were theists. They were people who believed in a God. You know, th these are names that you recognize like uh, Copernicus and Kepler and Pascal and uh, Galileo and Isaac Newton. Uh, some of you know uh, the name Robert Boyle, who was considered to be the father of modern chemistry, uh, you know, writing and studying back in the 17th century. Like when you just kind of look early on, people that really began making scientific advances, that many of them were believers or at least theists. When you jump ahead to more modern age or, or today's time, you know, you've got guys like Francis Collins, who's former head of the Genome uh, Project, uh, author of The Language of God. Uh, you know, you've got guys like Anthony uh, Hewish, who was Nobel Prize winner. Uh, someone like Sir Gillian Prince, who's a prominent botanist. Some of these names may not be household names in your house or in mine, but in the world of science, these are names that, that they would recognize. Okay, these are real contributors to the area of science. And so we want to make sure that, you know, people don't feel like that there are no believers People who believe in God, they're part of science. That, that's not true. And so, obviously, on the science camp, there are a number of very gifted, intelligent, brilliant people that are in that camp. And so, really, one of the things faith and science have in common is they both have prominent contributors to scientific advancement. A second thing that I want you to consider that they have in common is they both share a commitment to the principle of causality. They both share a commitment to the principle of causality. Now, you know what that is. That's the idea that for every effect, there is a cause. There is a cause for every effect. And so that assumption leads people into discovery. And we love it that science, as well as the uh, world of faith, hold to that. And so when you take your child to the pediatrician, and he or she's got a high fever and the rash and stuff. Like you want that doctor to be thinking, what is the cause to this effect? And so all of science, medical science comes into play where we can start identifying like what's the cause and so that we can treat the cause and bring about the desired effect of healing, of restoration. When you get on that plane Monday morning to travel to your next conference, you're happy that they understand the science of you know, uh, aerodynamics. Uh, and so uh, we, we recognize that science makes a huge contribution and uh, in the area of causality, it's, it's foundational to their whole approach to the world. In the area of faith, like we totally embrace the idea of causality. In fact, uh, many of the people who have made scientific discovery have done so because of the assumption that God is a God of order. And he's a God of structure, and he's created natural laws and systems that he's put into place that with that assumption, it gives you this expectation that there are going to be causes that can be discovered behind the effects in the world. And so both, both camps really do embrace the principle of causality. In fact, you know, among those who would describe themselves as believers of God, it's this principle of causality that produces one of the strongest arguments for the existence of God. Uh, in other words, uh, some of you are familiar with the cosmological argument, which basically says that the universe had a beginning. In other words, you know, the universe is expanding, and it's expanding at a slower rate of speed, which brilliant people have you know, extrapolated backwards to say, okay, the universe actually had a beginning point. Uh, you know, they, they have this, the Big Bang theory. It's this idea that the universe has not existed in steady state. So it had a beginning, and it raises the question, based on the principle of causality, how did something come from nothing? What was the cause for the something, for that effect? And so it really argues for the idea that maybe, maybe there's actually a God who didn't have a beginning, who is the cause for the effect. It's an effective argument. It's an effective clue. It's a good reason to kind of uh, uh, interject faith. But that, all of that is illustration of both camps sharing in common a commitment to the principle of causality. So they have that in common. They have people on both sides making major advancements. A third thing that I would just say is that they both share some concern about... Um, philosophical 
uh, presuppositions. Uh, they, they both share a concern about you know, ideological convictions that people in both camps kind of bring to whatever issue is being studied under, you know, in, in the science lab or whatever. Uh, it, you, know, you can call them philosophical convictions or presuppositions. And both sides are aware that the other side can kind of do this. And so it, it, it's mutual. So in other words, there are times when you're trying to track something down, when you're researching something and you reach, uh, you know, you're looking at the data and someone begins to move to a dogmatic conclusion beyond really what the data supports. They bring their ideology, their belief system into play. Let, let me try to illustrate this in a very simple way. Uh, you know, you can look at these letters G-O-D-I-S-N-O-W-H-E-R-E. -E, and you can look at that and you can study it and you start observing and you see the data. You've got 12 characters here. They're in uppercase. Looks to be like an aerial font, about maybe a 90 point. Uh, there's no separation between the letters. Each of the letters are separated equally. And like you're just looking at data. You're just looking at data. You're just putting down all the stuff. And then eventually ideology can come into play as you start drawing conclusions. What is the meaning of this? What conclusion can we draw from these? And some from an ideology of a no-God ideology would say, well, what this means is that God is nowhere. And others who are coming from a different ideology, what do they see? God is now here. Now, I know that's really simple, but it illustrates the idea that when both sides look at data, they bring their philosophical presuppositions, their ideological bent into it. Now, they try not to. We try not to. Everybody needs, wants to be completely objective, but it can creep in there. In fact, let me just give you a couple of explanations, you know, frank admissions uh, to this on the part of, of kind of the science-only camp. Look, for example, at what the physicist uh, Hubert Yockey says, uh, in, uh, writing Information Theory and Molecular Biology. Uh, he, he writes this. He says, The belief that life on Earth arose spontaneously from non-living matter. Okay, that's the primordial soup. You know, from the goo to the zoo to you. He says, he says, the belief that life on earth arose spontaneously from non-living matter is simply a matter of what? Faith. In strict reductionism and based entirely on ideology. Now, that's, that, that's incredible. Let, let me give you one more. This is Darwinist uh, Richard Lewontin, uh, Harvard University. He says, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural, or faith. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its construct, constructs, because we have a prior commitment to materialism. We are forced by our prior adherence to material causes, no matter how counterintuitive, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Okay, all of this is just illustrative of the fact that they can bring their presuppositional convictions into the laboratory. Now, listen, what we need to acknowledge on this part of tone is that we can do the same thing. Uh, we can, you know, look at the data and kind of, uh, you know, reach a point where there's confusion and we're not sure how to interpret, and we just kind of, you know, just, just basically punt and go to God. I think that's what the person's trying to illustrate with this cartoon here. So you see, you know, a professor here with a student, and there's they're scientists, they're 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 mathematics and mathematicians, and they've got this elaborate formula. And and I don't know if you can read that writing here, but he, he says, I think you should be a little bit more explicit here in step two, you know, where it just says, you know, and then a miracle occurs. And and if you're catching what I'm trying to say to you, it's like this. Uh, the people on the faith side say about the science side, it's like, you know, you, you rule out the, the, the existence of number four, and then you're asking the question, what is two plus two? But you can't answer it because you've ruled out ahead of time the number four. 
And the people in the, in the science side, they basically say, you know what? It doesn't really matter what question is being asked. You, your go-to answer is number four. It's number four. And so when we say, well, what's 168,000 plus 246? And you go, four. It's four. Like We just kind of, kind of punt too quick there. And so one of the things I'm trying to say to you is that when, when we're interacting with somebody who's pushing back on entertaining faith or, or considering biblical Christianity, faith alone and Christ alone, and, and it's because they struggle with this idea of science, that one of the things that we can say is that, you know, I, I get that because it, it does seem like it's sometimes they're pitted against each other. But I really think there is a lot that they have in common. And I think for someone who really wrestles with that, that is intriguing. I think it would be very natural for them to say, really, what, what do you think they have in common? Well, you know, I, I think you know, there have been people on both sides who have made huge advancements, scientific advancements. And also, I think that one of the biggest things, kind of underlying science, that faith embraces as well as this principle of causality. I think that's huge, and you can talk about, like, they share that. And then as well as the idea that I think both sides recognize that, if they're intellectually honest, that both sides are guilty at times of really bringing their ideology into uh, the, you know, the laboratory, they you know, they develop a dogmatism that really goes beyond the data. And I, I think that that's helpful. Then, of course, that just kind of moves us to, well, what would be the truth? Like, what are some things that we, that we might share that would be helpful to the degree that they're interested and willing to go forward and have more discussion? So uh, as we move to the third part of our message here, I want to invite you to open your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, uh, as you turn there, what, what I want to do here is, you know, say faith and science actually can be complementary is kind of the word you want to fill in here. That in this next section of the message, I really want to kind of bring us to the point where we can say with confidence that, that faith and science can be complementary. They can be friends. They don't have to be pursued or uh, perceived as foes. And one of the things uh, I want us to think about here is to recognize that there are some limits to science. There, there, there are some boundaries, if you will. What, what are the boundaries of science? And as we come to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, uh, God is speaking uh, through the Apostle Paul, and he's talking about the very important issue of life after death. He's talking about the crucial issue of, is there something about man an immaterial part of man, call it, you know, his soul, call it uh, uh, this uh, ongoing consciousness that survives the death of the body. And, and Paul's talking about that in here. And what's interesting is that when you, you think of from a science perspective, science is really built on the assumption of materialism. And, you know, by that, we don't mean that they, you know, are looking for riches and possessions. We, we're using materialism in a philosophical term that they believe that all reality can be defined and limited to the five senses, that which we can hear and see and taste and touch and smell. And so science is incredibly valuable in what it contributes in the physical realm, like kind of within that idea. But there are issues like what we're talking about here about you know, the consciousness, the soul of man that, that survives the death of the body, the idea of, of life after death. And so as we look at 1 Corinthians 15, we don't have time to look at this whole chapter, but uh, let me point you to verse 50. I want you to just see how God is affirming both the, uh, you know, something about man that survives the death of the body and about heaven and about hell and about afterlife. He says, I tell you this, brothers, uh, verse 50, that flesh and blood, he's talking about our body, isn't he? He says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Let's just understand that for this purposes as heaven, okay? So it, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Sleep here is a euphemism for death. We will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and what? The dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And so what we see here is that the Bible, truth here, is affirming something that is beyond really the realm of science. It's beyond the reach of science. It's asserting a truth claim. It's asserting a truth that science can't really measure and and, and deal with. And so sometimes what we need to, I think, be ready to interact with is the idea that, that science answers a whole lot of questions. But there are some questions that it cannot answer. In fact, uh, I want you to entertain that thought a, a little bit more. Let me get you to watch this video right here. There's a whole bunch of natural phenomena that, but that you know, religious people used to just attribute to God. Uh, you know, it, thunder is the sky god getting angry or, or whatever. And now we have scientific explanations for this. We know exactly how thunder works. We know how lightning works. We know how clouds form. We know, uh, you know, to choose a biblical example, why there's a rainbow. It's because of a, the prism effect, right, of, of moisture in the atmosphere. And so it can feel like there's no need for God anymore because we've got scientific explanations for all this. Uh, however, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of questions science has opened up that actually didn't exist in pre-modern times or pre-scientific times that are even harder to answer than why is there thunder or why is there a rainbow? And that's a question like, for example, why does the universe have a beginning? Because uh, for a long time, uh, in the kind of early modern era, people just assumed it was steady state. The universe had always been there. Uh, So there was no need for a creator because you didn't have a beginning. Uh, And then you get the prediction of the Big Bang, uh, that there actually was a beginning, and then you get experimental confirmation of the Big Bang uh, through the background radiation and so forth. And you realize, now we have to explain why there's something rather than nothing. And that is not a science, there is no scientific answer to that. There's a scientific answer to why is the sky blue or why is there thunder, but there is no, there, you can't form a scientific question uh, about why there's something rather than nothing. Science can't get there. Uh, another one is consciousness. Human beings are aware of ourselves, and other creatures even seem to have a little bit of this aware awareness. And we're ask, we're in the world asking questions of the meaning of the world, and we do things like mathematics, right? We start uh, doing math, and we find out that the math that somebody cooked up on a blackboard or on, a, on a, in a notebook somewhere connects to the. The, the way the universe actually works? Why in the world does math work? Why, why do we have the kinds of brains that can come up with math that actually describes the universe? Uh, th- that is not a scientific question, but it's a question that we only have now because we see how well math works for explaining the world. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's, uh, there are some questions that have been answered and that we don't need religion to sort of answer at a a physical level. But then there are other questions raised by science that now there's no way to answer them as scientists. We have to have a a philosophical or a theological answer to them. And so in a way, it's it's just the questions that have changed, and and in, in many ways it's gotten harder not to believe that there's some kind of rationality, some kind of purpose, some some kind of consciousness cosmically that corresponds to what we see around us in human beings and in the world that we've been given. Okay, so I appreciate what he's saying. He, he, you know, wh- one of the things that I hope that you're hearing today is how valuable science is and how much we should embrace the contributions of science. But in doing that, we also recognize, and I think this is a helpful point in interaction with our neighbors, is that there are some limits that science 
Science can't speak to some of the issues and some of actually big issues, big, big issues in life uh, because of their limits, their kind of boundaries of materialism kind of keeps them from looking at that. So, uh, you know, that, that's one of the things that might be some of the boundaries with science. L let me give you one more. That in addition to kind of their materialistic uh, frame in which they operate, in addition to materialism is their methodology. And so we all know from as far back as eighth grade science, right, that, you know, the empirical scientific method, that like how does science go about proving or validating its theories? Well, it's, it's two things. It's observation and repetition. Those are the two real building blocks uh, in terms of methodology for science. And so when, when, when you take those things, you recognize that given that they have, made incredible discoveries and contributions, but that methodology doesn't work on other issues. Let me give you an example, like history. Like, when it comes to proving something that has happened in history, or maybe there's some truth claim of a historical nature, that you can't observe that and repeat it in a laboratory. And so science it's just set up in terms of their methodology, really, really good, but it's limited uh, in, in terms of what they can do. And so when you think about these issues about, you know, is there life after death? Is there a resurrection? Is there something within man that's not material? It's immaterial. Call it the soul that it survives. Okay, when it comes to those questions, they, they can't really speak to that. It's outside of materialism outside of methodology, but it's fair for them to go, well, well, what about faith? Okay, so faith claims that there is something about man that survives, and there is an afterlife, and they would go so far as to say there is a heaven and a hell and all of that, but what basis does faith have for saying that? Which is a really, really good question, a very, very fair question. And so what we would say at this point in terms of trying to present truth is, is say, well, even in this very chapter about resurrection, if you flip backwards to the very first of the chapter, is that what God presents to us is that there is a resurrection, and the reason why we know that to be true is because historically we have evidence that God Himself, the Son, God the Son, Jesus Christ, was resurrected. And of course, those coming from a scientific frame of mind, understandably are going to kind of go, what? Like, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. You know, I heard the whole Easter deal. But you really, you believe that? Well, when it comes to validating historical claims, there are some universally established criteria by which historical claims are judged. Every time you pick up and read a biography in history, Ted Roosevelt or or Andrew Jackson, John Adams, like whatever it is, like the, his, the history, the authors, they have to validate what they claim to be true. And so when you come to the first part of this chapter, what you find is that our basis for faith is the claim of the resurrection of Jesus. And how would we validate that? Well, watch what uh, God says to us in verse 3. He says, for I delivered to you, this is Paul speaking, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. So if we take just a couple of minutes to break down what Paul is saying, he's saying like, how in the world, like what basis would we have? Are there any reasons? You know, you can't remove faith, but are there any clues? Are there any reasons 
why we would actually believe that Jesus was raised with the implication that we can be raised from the dead. Well, first of all, uh, you'll notice here that he says there are credible witnesses. There are credible witnesses. Any historian, anyone working in the area of history has to weigh the credibility of the people who are uh, you know, uh, giving evidence about the life of somebody. And so, you know, you're looking at letters and you're looking at documents and speeches and, and you're trying to ascertain, like, are these credible witnesses? And so when you look at the ones here, he talks about these, these apostles. And first of all, you need, you need to know about regarding credibility is that they are eyewitnesses and they are early witnesses. And though I wish I had more time because this is a whole nother message, but just kind of getting some highlights here, they are incredibly credible witnesses because they're eyewitnesses to what Jesus did that when he was raised from the dead. I mean, look at what he says here. He says, uh, for our sins, he was buried and he was raised, and then uh, he appeared to Cephas. Uh, this is Peter. He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And he goes on how he appeared to others as well. So these are eyewitness accounts. And then also you have to note that these are early accounts because those who tend to want to undermine the Bible, they want to convince you that this book was written, you know, second, maybe even third century A.D. When there's, the evidence is clear and strong that this book is written probably somewhere between 50 and 52 A.D. This is a mere 20 to 22 years after the death of Christ. This is right on top of it. And so he's saying, I've got eyewitness accounts, and they're very early. You know, it takes a while for legend to develop and myth, but this is right there. And so if they're eyewitness accounts and they're early accounts, and that speaks to the credibility of these witnesses. The second thing that I want you to notice is that they have corroborating witnesses. Corroborating witnesses. In other words, some may wrongly think that, well, you know, there was, you know, some fanatic who, you know, had some kind of delusional dream or vision and Jesus appeared and that was it, but, you know, it caught on and people followed it. No, it's not just one person who claims that they saw him. As I continue reading, it says that he appeared to Cephas in verse 5. And then to the 12. Okay, so now you have 13 people on at least two different occasions. If you go into the gospel, it's actually more than two before all 12 see him. But nevertheless, 13 people in two occasions. And then it says, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And so what he says here is that, okay, if this was just a delusion, can we really expect that 513 people all had the same delusion? And then, like, if this wasn't solid enough, he goes on to say, 500 people, and most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. There have been some who have died. But the vast majority are still alive. Implication, you don't believe me? Go talk to them. You see, if you tell me that one day in September of 20, uh, 2001 that two planes hit the two towers and knocked them down, and I said, that's ridiculous. There's no way I believe that. No, it happened. We have video footage of it. <laughs> you, can, you can develop anything. You can you know, Photoshop anything. All right? There were a lot of people who saw it. Go talk to them. You see, they're still alive. A day will come when no one will be alive who saw it. But the point is now... Like, go to stink in New York and, and talk to people and interview them. And so what he's saying here is that not only do you have these very credible witnesses, eyewitness, early witnesses, but you have these large number of corroborating witnesses. And most of them, like, they're available for you to go and interview. Like, go talk to this person, hear their story, and go talk to this person, compare the notes. And what you're going to find is, like, this is, this is a, a genuine historical fact. And if that wasn't enough, let me give you one more. Paul goes on talking, and he says, last of all, as to one untimely born, since Paul, remember, wasn't one of the 
original 12 disciples, that he actually saw the resurrection of Christ a, a few years later, uh, not many years, but a few years later on the road to Damascus. He was a Pharisee at the time, which he talks about here, who was actually trying to end the church. He was persecuting those who claimed that Jesus was resurrected. And he says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. He says, I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. In other words, he said, he's saying, the third line of evidence here is that I am a changed person. Changed witnesses. Like who can account or explain you know, cause and effect. What is the cause for him having such a major turnaround to go from arresting and beating and uh, uh, contr uh, contributing to the, the martyrdom, like, for example, Stephen, the death of these believers, to being the, the most prominent promoter of Jesus Christ? Uh, others of you who know the gospel stories well, you, you know that the Followers of Jesus at the time of his arrest, as John alluded to during the prayer time this morning, like they, they all ran away from Jesus. They were scared to death of suffering the same fate as Jesus. But then three days later, Jesus appears to them. And in a very short number of days, they're out in the streets of Jerusalem proclaiming to the very people who killed Jesus they are in their face saying that this Jesus is the one whom you crucified, but God raised him up from the dead. And the radical change in Paul's life and in the other apostles, again, gives further evidence of the reality of the resurrection of Christ. And so there are some issues like we're talking about that science, as valuable as it is, it just cannot speak into. And then regarding these historical issues that claims that the Word of God itself, when we come and we look at those using the universally accepted standards for evaluating credible testimony, and you look at what we find here, incredible evidence for believing in the resurrection of Christ. And all of its implications for life after death and all of those. So, if you're interacting with someone who's very, very, very pro-science, and because of that, somewhat skeptical about faith, I think there's much we can say. And may we never resolve, uh, re, you know, just dissolve into uh, science bashing. And uh, in the face of faith bashing, we can simply say, listen, <laughs> faith and science actually have much in common. And they can be very complementary. There are some things that science speaks to really well and some that they can't. Let me give an example. That's where we want to go. Uh, would you just do me a favor and, and uh, bow your head and close your eyes if that's helpful to you. I, I just want to give you a chance. If, if you're here today, and maybe you have been one of those who, you know, your religion has really been science. Maybe you've never would have never put it together that way or articulated it that way, but your hope is in science and technology that's going to solve all the problems in the world. Um, you believe that science disproves the existence of God, and perhaps today you've heard something that might uh, give you pause in that and will, um, reason to reconsider. I just want to say to you that th this, this God, uh, this Jesus who was raised from the dead, is that He loves you. And the reason why He had to rise from the dead is that He died. He was crucified. And the Bible tells us that the reason why He died was as a payment for our sins. That He was perfect and without sin. and So He went as our um, completely unblemished sacrifice in our place. That He took the rap for us. He was our substitute. That Jesus died for us, that as God, who loves us, found the only way to pardon us. 
And so if that makes sense to you and, and you've never really responded to that and you wanted to in simple faith to let Jesus know that you believe in Him and that you acknowledge that His death was for you and that you want His death to be applied as payment for your sin, if this is the day you want to become a Christian and begin following Christ, you can express your faith in a real simple way, just in the quietness of your own heart, just between you and God. Uh, right now you can simply say, God, I believe in Jesus. I believe that as your son, that he died on the cross to pay for my sins. And I believe you raised him from the dead as proof. And I want him to be my savior. Jesus, I want you to be in my life. And I want to follow you. And if that's the prayer of your heart, the Bible says that at that moment that you, your whole eternal destiny changes addresses. You're going to have eternity to spend a future with, with, with the Lord in heaven. And you have forgiveness right now. And you have a new a freedom to live the kind of life that you really long to live. Brought about by the power of God's Spirit that comes into your life. Amen.